relationship to the degree that he makes a way that all mankind can be saved. Isn't that amazing? He knows we're going to mess this up. And yet he takes care of fixing the problem and maintaining a relationship with us. He makes that possible. So when it comes to what we treasure, who's best suited to take care of that? He is. Now there are going to be times... How many of you own a fireproof safe? Anyone? Why do you own a fireproof safe? To keep stuff safe in case of fire. <laughs> Boom! That seems pretty, pretty... Why else would you have a fireproof safe? Right? Mine is so safe, right? Safes are... They're designed to keep things safe, right? Mine is so wonderfully safe from theft that I leave the key in it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I literally only have it for fire. It's the reason we have it. Because I'm like, someone's just going to walk off with this thing, so I may as well let them take the contents if they want it and possibly leave the safe. But there are actions that we may take in order to be prudent with what God has given us, right? But there is a difference between prudence an obsession. And we need to walk that journey with God as he leads us in taking care of what he's given us and at the same time not holding it so tightly that it becomes what we are after. Would you read with me Matthew 6 today? Matthew 6 is part of a very potent section of Matthew. There's lots and lots of things that go on in, in this area of Matthew. And if you don't like football, or even if you do like football, during halftime today, sometime today, you can read a good part of Matthew right here, and it will help you wrestle with life. So if by some way or another, you happen to be wrestling in life right now, this whole section of scripture would be helpful for you. But if you've got life all figured out, then don't worry about it. <laughs> Matthew 6, we're going to pick up at 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures in, on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will de be devoted to, to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? And look, the body, is, and the body is more important than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown in, and tomorrow is thrown into a fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For pagans run after these things. 
And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's a fun passage, isn't it? And it's really easy when we hear the phrase, don't worry, to listen, right? Oh, don't worry about it. Okay, I won't. It's that easy, right? How many of us can pull that off? Anyone? That's true. Don't worry about it. Well, that's easy. I wasn't. I actually didn't care about that at all. I can, I can tell you one thing right now, just because I know Katie enough, that I can tell you she is not worried about who's going to be playing in the Super Bowl. She's not worried about it. And it, that's an easy thing for us to say, Katie, don't worry about the Super Bowl. She's got it. I was going to say, I don't even think she watches the thing. So there are things that you don't worry about, aren't there? There are. And my guess is that they have nothing to do with your life. I realized that there are, there are people who I know as acquaintances that when they have things go down... One of my friends actually, well, acquaintances, I guess, because it, it really didn't hit me that hard. And I'm like, That's, this is odd. This is an odd encounter because I know who this is. I quasi know this guy, and he's having significant life issues right now. And I'm like, well, that kind of stinks. But it, didn't, it did not cause within me any strife. I'm like, wow. That's, that's, that's weird. It, it did not cause for me the same concern, the same angst as what I experienced when one of us would have the same issue. If one of you had this issue, then I would be very concerned. I'd be fervently praying. I may even come see you in the hospital type thing. <laughs> someone from the church will come see you it may not be me but that's how the church is supposed to work that we take care of each other it's not just total sidebar here it's not my job to do that just so that we understand each other but when we worry about things they typically have something to do with us This passage starts off where we picked up. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Or I'm sorry, on earth where moth and rust destroy. And we talked a little bit about what we treasure earlier. And why, why is it that we treasure anything? Okay, it gives us pleasure. Memories. Okay, it helps maybe define how we're viewed or our, possibly our identity. Okay, maybe it's something what, what we do. Okay. Our, our perspective is that we have to have it in order to survive. It's true. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you have ever seen something that you value significantly and you see it for sale for like two dollars? And you're like, I can't 
can't believe that they would sell that for $2. They don't, that, and that's what we say. They don't know what it is. But what's the reality of any item? What's the reality of its worth? It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Somebody's willing to pay for it. Exactly. Monetarily, something is only worth what someone will pay for it. That's it. That's it. And what we value, what we treasure, I believe that this passage helps us understand that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The reason we treasure anything is because it involves our heart. We have life investment in it. And therefore, that's why we value that so much more than other stuff or other relationships or other items. We're involved. We have personal stake in that. And that's why we're told to, to lay up treasure in heaven, to lay up treasure where moth and rust are not going to destroy. How much? Think about that for a moment. How does that translate then to where we are placing what we value? We're placing it where God is. Our value, what, what we value, what we treasure, when we focus at, it, at that point, from that dynamic, it begins to help us treasure what God wants and what God has in store for us that we may be with Him more often. And that's easy, right? You're laughing at me. Why are you laughing at me? Why is it that some things that are so simple are so difficult? We, we have a knack as human beings to make things significantly more difficult than they are. I, I rec I've, I've got a friend I graduated with from high school. She's a math teacher out in Colorado. And she put up a math puzzle on Facebook the other day, of which I believe I correctly and quickly solved. She said, this took me way too much time to figure out. Now, what's the difference? She's got a master's degree in mathematics. I don't. And I simply looked at it found the pattern, placed the number. That's all I had to do. She looked at it and began probably to, well, if I take this and do this and this and this, and because she knew how to do all that stuff. I didn't even know those things. I, I don't even know what those things are. She's placing the alphabet stuff in there, and I'm like, Bleh, I don't know. And the same can happen for us that as we begin to to see what God wants for us, we believe that we have to be so intricately involved that we mess it up significantly by making it much more difficult than it has to be. It's a, it's a knack that we have to mess things up, to make them harder than they have to be. And God invites us to store up our treasure where he is so that our heart will be with him. We're told that the, the eye is the lamp of the body. Now, what, what is the eye? What, ha, what does the eye do? Sees it sees things. <coughs> okay? It may process. I think the eye only sees. It, there are some communication lines, and then the, it, it goes to a processor. Maybe I'm incorrect in that. It does deal with some things of, of how things get perceived and whatnot, so you could call that processing, I guess. Most of the time, people are surprised. That's true. Close your eyes for a moment. What do you see? You see shadows, possibly, or outlines, or a negative image of what you've been seeing, possibly. 
but you're not seeing anything new until you reopen your eyes, are you? The eye is what lets things in. Now, what's a, what, what about our eye is funny? Has your eye ever reached a point that it's like, oh, I've seen way too much, stop. Have you ever had that? You have? Okay. Okay, so it can become overwhelmed that you're like, I need a break. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. There's a mic right there. <laughs> but when two eyes meet, that that's when two spirits meet. That's when a spiritual connection is made. Oh, yeah? Because when, like, my eye, you know, and, and that's why so many of us turn away. Huh. Because we're afraid of that spiritual connection. Your eyes do communicate significantly. You're right. If Even without speaking. What's that? If they don't, you don't get depth perception. Well, that's true. That's true. Uh huh. There's a lot of weird things that that our body does by design, and we don't necessarily understand fully how that happens. There are some who have studied it and significantly understand how that all works. But yet they can't change it. Or why would they? I mean, why would they want to? But there are many things that as we, as we look at this passage, we look at the eye as the lamp of the body. The eye is what we use to bring in information. And there's typically not a lack for what we bring in. And we typically don't ever find enough. Your eyes, aside from, that's a good point, but there are many times when our eyes are constantly hungry. You've heard the eyes bigger than your, your stomach. You know, you can see much more than what you ever have capacity to deal with. And our eyes, as we deal with life, need to help us focus on what God wants to give us and what God's doing in our lives because our eyes will be able to find other things that they will want, that will cause us to desire, that are outside of what God wants or desires for our lives. Shiny, yes. Woo, shiny. You're right. It, the passage spells out, you cannot serve two masters. Have you found that to be true in your life? Have you ever served two masters? How many of you have ever had multiple bosses? It's difficult, isn't it? And what, what happens in those dynamics of when you have two bosses? What happens? You are. And how do, you, how do you deal with the dynamic of that confusion? You quit. <laughs> What's that? You, got, you do. You have, to, you have to assign value to which one you're going to deal with. Because ultimately, you can't do what both are asking if they're asking different things. You can't do it. And so we assign value to someone that we now say, well, this person... This person's desires are this. This one wants this. And so I'm going to go with however we assign that value. It's difficult. And our lives are no different. We have, we have a master. right? We like to think, I'm free. I am my own person. I will do what I want. Right? We do have that option. What in... What influences those options? Everything comes with a price. You're right. What influences those options? What you value. Yep. 
Well, let's help you. I don't know. <laughs> we all had stuff to throw out there. And what came to my mind was that verse in Proverbs, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So that's on me. And if I don't think I'm worth it, I'm not going to be reading the word or, you know, standing or. Sure. But that's my responsibility to guard my heart. But that that's in there with stuff that's of value to all of us. Right? That is the issue of why we shove so hard on our identity for so long. I know some of us got sick of hearing about our identity, right? Like, oh, my gosh, why are we still talking about this? But our identity is so important. How we view ourselves. When you look in the mirror, how you view, view yourself, because of who you are in Christ, you are of value. Probably much more than you assign yourself. Now, don't get to the point that you like your reflection so much. Okay, that's bad too. But you are valued simply because you are made in the image of God. That is bestows value to you right there. And that is reason enough to get up and do what God calls you to do. Now that, it's also an invitation to grow. You will never outgrow what God's doing in your life. You will grow into it and there will be another thing. There will be another experience. There will be another encounter. There will be another relationship. Now, I'm not sharing with that just so you're like, oh my gosh, there's not going to be something else. I'm just going to stop now. That's ridiculous. We must continue to press into who God's calling us to be because of who he's already created us to be. And as we wrestle with this idea of having two masters, we cannot. You cannot have two masters. Now, Scripture brings up money. Money's been a big deal for humanity for a long time. Currency of some point, whatever it may be, whether it be salt or gold or worthless paper it, it doesn't matter what it is we have currency and we we use currency for lots and lots of things but if currency becomes your master then we've misplaced our trust you cannot serve both God and money you will serve one or the other and unfortunately in some cases uh, if it's money, then you will serve it well. If it's God, then that's a great thing. You'll serve him well as well. But it's, it, it's that same angst that we experience when we're trying to serve both that we experience when we have two bosses. It's the same dynamic of like, ugh, like what is going on here? Now, who's in control of money? Okay. The government? They, they can try to tell you how much it's worth and how much we need. But again, the way that ours is set up, it's only worth what someone's willing to give for it, right? Products, they increase in value. Not because, or increase in, I'm sorry, increase in price. Not necessarily value. But they increase in price because of how much it costs to make, right? Do you, do you appreciate in value? Appreciate. Do you, like, in most cases, real estate typically goes up, right? It becomes more valuable with time. Do you become more valuable with time? Yes? Okay. We're, it, this is creating, yes, thank you. This is creating angst for all of us. And I'm, I, it's good. We have to wrestle through this. As we grow, we may become more valuable to some of the other people around us. But you need to understand, you cannot increase in value to God because he already loves you infinitely. You can learn nothing more to have him love you more. It's, it's not possible because of how he loves you already. 
So as we look at, at serving one master or another, money will degrade your value. There's no other way around it. Money's not going to bring more value to you. It may bring more value to your bank account, but that's not more value to you. Right? But our value in Christ is infinite. You can't assign a value to it, and you can't increase it because infinite can't be increased. Now, you may become more valuable, and, and that's why I believe God calls us to grow in him so that we can in turn help others grow in him as well, that we may grow together. But we are not able to create more value to God because of how we're growing. We are already valued as high as we can go. I hope that brings you joy and confidence in continuing to do what God had calls you to do. Because it, it, it takes pressure off. Why do you do things for a boss? What? So you can get fired. Yeah, right? Yeah. You, we do things for a boss on this earth because it's our job. We want to get our paycheck. We, we want to, to do what we've been assigned to do. Or we, we do it begrudgingly because, well, this is my job and I need a paycheck. Type thing. That's, that's wonderful. That's called being, that's called being uh, significantly blessed with that opportunity. It's not always a reality for everyone. shouldn't be any reason for me to want to continue to please God. Okay. You know what I mean? I mean, like, well, why, why should I worry? He's not going to love me anymore. Well, I, that's, I don't want to get the wrong message there. That's true. I don't you want know, you to get the I wrong should, message I either. I should continue to want to please him, not, not thinking, well, he's not going to love me anymore or any less. Yep. Your love grows for him. That's why you increasingly want to please him. And while I've got the mic. <laughs> okay. Uh, when you talked about Adam and Eve and they were hiding uh -huh. and God came to them, what he had in his hands were love and forgiveness. You're right. They didn't think they deserved that. They knew they were wrong. So they were hiding. Amen. God still comes to us with love and forgiveness. He didn't love Adam and Eve any less because they sinned. He grieved because what could have been for them was no longer. Yeah. But he still loved them as much as he always did when he first created them. That's true. And that's the same for us, is that he comes to us with love and forgiveness. And he always loves us infinitely. There's Can I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, just real briefly because you know the concept that some people have is God loves me. All I need is to know that he loves me. Mm -hmm. But it's back to, you know, Rick made the comment about you know working with the child and you know because you, you love working with the child. But the goal is to transfer something to that child. And as the child grows, he gets to the point where I want to make this look like <coughs> dad made it. I want to yep. make this macaroni and cheese the way, because it tastes so good. They, they start transferring. My desire is to imitate yeah. the one who loves me so much. And so that's the transition that we go through. It's, it's not that I like to make this mess, and I, I can't help it. I make a mess. God loves me anyhow. Yep. But as we grow in the knowledge of him, we want to be more like him so that what we produce has that same flavor, has that same taste, has that same effect. You know, it's, yep. you can tell who the craftsman has trained 
because of the way the craftsmen taught. You'll see their marks. Yes. I believe it says that God told them not to eat of the tree of good and evil. Uh -huh. When they ate of the tree of good and evil, they knew what evil was. They knew what they had done. They wouldn't have known that. When we know what we, when I know what I've done, or you know, sure. if anybody, any human being, it brings up shame, and shame brings up pain, and it's true. they didn't want to, it was like what Greg said, you know, getting a gift, that the one incident you mentioned, and not knowing where, why do I, why do I, <laughs> I'm not talking one. <laughs> Why do I deserve this? Why do I, you know, and they hid because it would have been painful to them to have a dialogue with God for them. Sure. It was their side of the court. God. You're right. How many of us have had this encounter when someone gives us something that we know, we know we do not deserve? How do you receive that? Like, you're, you're doing what? You're giving me what? I guess I was thinking a good thing, but I guess there are bad things as well that people give you that you're like, I don't want this. Like, why, why am I getting this? Type thing. And it all comes down to value. I didn't, I didn't, in either case, I didn't do what I did to deserve this. Either I did a better job so I don't deserve this, or I did nothing, or very little, and I don't deserve that type thing. We, can, we assign value to lots and lots of things in life. We assign value to relationships, to experiences, to items. We assign value to virtually everything that we ever encounter. And God tells us in his word, in, in this passage of Matthew that we read, he says, do not worry about your life. And all of this stuff that we've talked about so far, in assigning value and treasuring and all this stuff, he says, don't worry. Now, how is it that he can say, don't worry about your life? He's got this. He's got this. Do you believe that? How do you show that you believe that you trust that God's got your life? How do you show that? Okay, you trust him. What's that look like? Like I, I can say I trust Dewey. Okay. Gratitude. Oh. No what? No matter what happens. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's what goes in the box, that just so you know, if you still need to put something in here. Uh-huh. We can, again, we are good at making things difficult. But I think it comes back to the law aspect. Yep. That when we don't believe that God loves us, and we, we don't think it's going to turn out for good because we know we don't deserve it, so we think God's going to come after us with a big check. Well, he did. It was a cross. So it's already paid for. That's right. He settled, settled it. The accounts are settled, not because of anything we could do to fix it. He settled the accounts at the cross to deal with 
any decrease of value. He redeemed us in his work to bring about our value that he first created us with. That's true. So if he can get us to not believe that we're enough, yep. to not believe that God is good, then we're standing out. Yep. But it's imaginary standing because we already know God is good and he loves us. And everything he yep. does is for our good because he said that and he never lied. You're right. Have you ever um have you ever been stuck in something so long because of circumstances and when the circumstances go away you still feel stuck has that ever happened there there are times when there may be a physical restriction of some sort for so long that when that restriction goes away you still feel as though you have to live with that restriction sin is that same way we feel as though we still have to live as that sinner, even though we have forgiveness, even though God does give us love, even though he's paid the price in order to deal with it, we still feel as though we have to live with that restriction, right? Now, the reality is that we still, most of us, I, I, I can't say definitively, but I will say significantly most of us still deal with sin of some sort or another. I'll just go out on a limb and say that. Okay. Belinda wants to throw daily in there. So, I mean, we'll, we'll throw it in there. Momently. As we, as we deal with life, we deal with sin, right? But the reality is that God has paid for it, and we, can, we have the chance. It's now possible to live beyond or live differently than what our sinful nature wants to. We have that worth. We have the love. We've got the, the power, if you will, not because of what we have done, but because of what God has done in our life. And that is how we can live differently than the pagans, as they're called in this passage, where it says, why do you worry about clothes? Why do you worry? Why are you concerned with these things? Why are you real worried about food? Why are you worried about all of this stuff? And then he, he compares the lilies of the field to Solomon's splendor. And he says, not even Solomon was dressed like these, these flowers. And are you not much more worthwhile than they? So when it comes to our, what we treasure, it comes down, to, I believe, to this. Do we trust God or not? And there's only one way to show trust. You can say that you trust something. There's only one way to show trust, and that's to go out and trust in a way that shows it. How many of you have ever been on a ladder? Do you, did you trust that the ladder would do what its job is? Yeah. Not, the first step. Not the first step. I recently got on a ladder to go up into an attic. My neighbor asked me to help him with something, and no problem. Up and down a few times to you know, get, of course... You know, me doing a simple job required several trips to my garage to get things that were needed to fix his garage. But the, um, the lovely, uh, it was about the, the fifth time I had to go up because we had finished things on the outside, so now we had to go inside and go back into the attic to, to finish it. Last time up the ladder, first rung, boom! The rung busted loose on the ladder. It was the first, Yes. There's no better place to have a ladder break on you than the first step, especially when it's only about three inches, so it's not a big deal. It wasn't a problem. But it created, now, the next time I go to get on the ladder, there's going to be a little bit of hesitation with that first step, right? That's what happens. Our experiences play into what goes down. So we can only trust from what we know to be our experience. That's where God invites us to grow. 
I, I, I feel many times as though I trust God significantly, and then he throws me another opportunity to show that I can still grow in my trust with him. It's crazy how it works. But it's like, okay, Lord, I, I trust you with my life. And he's like, great, come on. Whoa, wait a second here. I just got to this point. Can't we just sit here for a moment? Like, can't we just enjoy this, like, full trust thing? But there's always this moment of, like, like, like a, a father inviting a child to know that I've got you. You are safe. But come on. Let's go. And to, to continue to grow in that trust. I trust God more than I used to. Did you know that? Because I've grown in that. But he continues to give me a bigger trust tank. He upgrades me, if you will, so that I can trust him even more. And as the trust with God increases, so do the things he calls us into. And it's a wonderful opportunity because we get to do cooler and grander things. Again, we assign our own value, but there are times when God invites us to do things that we had never imagined we would do before. Because he increases our trust. And he encourages us, as he does in the beginning, to watch me. That's what this is about. He wants us to trust him so that we will watch and do what he does. God loves showing off. Did you know that? If you don't believe me, look at the encounter of bringing the, Egypt, or bringing the uh, Israelites out of Egypt. That whole thing is to show off how God is trustworthy and how he will do what he says. And he's doing the same. God does that work all the time in our lives, too. He gives us opportunities. Our struggles are opportunities for God to say, watch this. And our God is really good at watch this moments. But you've got to let him, and you've got to watch. Sometimes it's terrifying. Right? I remember, I remember helping our kids learn how to swim. Isaac now swims like a fish. But boy, the first, time, the first few times, it was like, it was hard for me to even stand in the water. And I'm, you know, it's three, three feet deep, and you know, I'm not three feet. It was, it was like, holy cow, just calm down, type thing. And now I don't even, I would let him swim in a pool without me. That's how confident I am in his swimming. And our trust goes to that degree of God inviting us to do his will, to trust in him, and to continue to, again, go back way to the beginning. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. We can set our trust in other things. We can trust in other stuff. We can treasure different items. But if it's separate from what God is doing in our lives, we will fail to grow in our trust with God. So as, as I said, the next, the, se the next several weeks are going to be dealing with what God has given us. Whether it be our, our, what's in your bank account, your possessions, your, your time and your relationships, all of these things. What, what is God inviting you to do with what he has given you? What is how is he inviting you to continue to go and invest your life in a way that shows that you trust him? How is it that what he has given you, you're giving and doing with as he calls? All right? So continue to reflect on this. And again, read the passage again. That would be one of the most helpful things you could do and continue to wrestle with this. What do I value? What do I, what do I treasure? Where is that at? How does that help me align with what God wants? How does that misalign with what God wants? Yeah. He will always be way ahead of us. Isn't that the crazy part? Why do I have to worry about forgiving myself? Like, he did that for me. Oh, wonderful. 
Emmy has gotten back into the habit of asking, are we there yet? <laughs> or are we about there? Even, even uh, to the point that even this morning, you know, on the way to our church service, are we almost there? And it takes us a whopping like five minutes to get from our place to here. And, and we can get to those, those seasons of life when we just, we want God to hurry up and do what he's doing. Come on already type moments, right? <laughs> God's like, really? We've got the rest of your life. We've got the rest of your life to accomplish what I want to do in your life. Now that's not an invitation to just sit there and do nothing. God does want us to, to, to come along with him. But there's times when we want God to just do something so fast that it just gets done. And come on, let's just do this. So it, it, we just need to realize that God has his own pace. And we will do well to keep in step with it instead of trying to do our own. So continue to reflect, continue to wrestle, continue to deal with, with life in a way that you know, steps into who we are, steps into our identity, but also begins to realize where is it that I trust God? How is it that I trust God? And where is it that I don't? Because there, you have those areas. We all do. I don't like, God is revealing to me areas that I don't trust him in. He's inviting me to trust him more, and it's like, mm, yeah. it's, it's these crazy moments. But he invites us to continue to grow in him. And these are the times, these are the seasons of life when these happen, that we, in, we, we experience exponential growth. And we encounter God doing much more in our lives. And we get to see him do these watch me moments. And really be impressed. And really just watch God do what God does best. And, and show off in a way that only he can. So let him show off. Let him show you something that helps you trust him more. Alright? God did... Uh, he did do this crazy thing, as, as was pointed out by Greg, that he took care of our sin long before we ever even, long before we were ever made. Most of us, I don't know, some of us might be that old, I don't know. But, but as we deal with life, as we go in his name to do his will, we have to remember that we get to go because of his work. Because of what he has done. Not because of how great we are. We, we are valued in him, yes. But he did the work. And we do what we do in remembrance of him. So we're going to take communion today. Uh, Dewey or Rick, or if one of you guys could. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna fight over it. Come on up, Dewey. So Rick, Rick's got it. Never mind. <laughs> Ouch. You weren't listening or you couldn't hear. <laughs> Ouch. Wow. <laughs> Lord, we thank you that you give us love, uh, both from, from your life to ours and from our lives to others. And Lord, even as we, as we joke back and forth, as we, um, as, as we poke one another in fun, Lord, we pray that you help us to be loved, that you help us to love well, and Lord, that as we struggle with life's issues, whether it be rest or work, or whether it be anxiety or worry, Lord, we just pray that you may help us trust you more. We thank you for the work that you did on the cross. <laughs> I, I, Lord, I love the picture of, of you dealing with life with a big stick, but not chasing us with it to beat us, but to hang on it and to, to take care of our sin. Lord, we thank you for your work, and we do this in memory of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We would invite you to come forth and take as you are ready. Again, we invite anyone who is a, a believer to do so.
Lord, we thank you for life. And we pray that as we go, you'd help us to trust you. That we may lay up our treasure in heaven with you. And that you'd help us to deal well with what you've given us here on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'd encourage you, if you have any last-minute entries or deposits or concerns, worries, doubts, consternations, blessings, blessings however it is that, uh, thank you, sweetie, what, whatever it is that you would like to contribute to this box, that you would like to hand off to God and say, you deal with this. You got this. I trust that you've got this. If there's anything else, then uh, I ask that you put it in there now. Otherwise, we've got the barrel right outside these doors. Um, I suppose we could probably even pop them open, and you could stand inside and watch it burn if you wish. Uh, or you may come outside and, and watch it burn as well. So, What's that? <laughs> so, if you'd like to watch it burn, you may. If you would not like to watch it burn and you're ready to go, then you may do that as well. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Have a great week. Dad, Honey, we're going to go take care of the box and then we'll get puppy. And, perforated pages. and last but not least, the back pocket comes with whiteboard paper. There is a river that washes you clean.